Good morning. Hope you're having a great day today. His name was Vanya, an 18-year-old boy who was drafted to spend two years in the Russian army. In his bunkhouse, word got around that he was a believer, a Christian. And actually, he had difficulty keeping silent about his good friend and Savior, Jesus Christ. His superior officers thought, we will keep him quiet. And they got him up at 10 p.m. when the lights were going out. They brought him a brand new summer uniform, had him put it on, and took him outside. And they told him to stand there until he denounced Christ. They thought, certainly, this will break him. Well, despite the 20 below temperatures in a summer uniform, he did not break. Night after night, they thought this will be it. He will denounce his faith in God. Well, after 14 days of this, they decided on another approach. Let's put him in a cold, damp prison without food. He, Vanya, thought, great, here's my opportunity to fast and to pray. Someone got the orders that they'd better break him or else they would be tending bears somewhere up in Siberia. They could not get him to deny his trust in Jesus Christ. Actually, sometime later, his father received a letter saying that his son had accidentally drowned in the Black Sea. A few days later, his father received a large zinc box with the remains of his son, Vanya. The box was welded shut, so he and some other men pried it open with some crowbars. What did they find? They found his son inside. His son's face was badly beaten, nearly unrecognizable. His chest was severely burned, and his heart had been punctured six times. Now the question we want to ask today is this. Was Vanya's faith extraordinary? Was his faith extraordinary? Our subject today is this. When revival comes. When revival comes. We're in Jonah once again today. And like two sides of a coin or two wings of a bird, every revival has two aspects which balance themselves in the plan of God. In response to prayer, God appoints a preacher. The preacher here is Jonah. And God appoints a message. And the message that Jonah preaches is this, that judgment is coming. And God appoints a place. He appoints a time. He appoints a power as well. And that was our last message. Now, in response to God, man hears, man then believes, man then repents, and then he prays, and he experiences personal revival. In our last lesson, we looked at revival from God's perspective. Today, in this lesson, we want to look at revival from man's perspective. Now, when revival came to Nineveh, it wasn't just a few people, but rather the whole city was swept by this revival. I'm going to read to you Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. And it starts out, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, Forty more days... And Nineveh will be overturned. Verse 5 says, The Ninevites believed God, and they declared a fast, and all of them, from greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. And when the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, he took off his royal robes, he covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. And then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and he did not bring upon them the destruction that he had threatened. 
Everyone was affected by the moving of the Lord. You know, in the New Testament, the word revival means this. It means to live again. It means to come back again to what we once knew. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, it says, But the rest of the dead did not come to life. Revival means come to life, to live again. In Romans 14, 9, Paul writes, For this end Christ died, and he rose, and he lived again. Luke 15, 4 says, This is my son who was dead and is alive again. So in the New Testament sense, revival means this. It means to live again. It means to be refreshed. It is to come back to the life we once knew. It is renewing our once fervent relationship with the Lord. Now Jonah came and preached in Nineveh. In Jonah chapter 3 verse 5 it says, The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast and all of them from greatest to the least put on sackcloth. <clears throat> now many Bible teachers say this, that the greatest miracle in Jonah is not that a great fish swallowed Jonah and then Jonah lived to tell about it, but rather the miracle of revival coming to Nineveh. Nineveh was known for its godless, pagan, heathen society. You see, there's a message of five Hebrew words. Those five Hebrew words were used to bring repentance and revival to one of the most wicked people on the face of the earth. Jonah chapter 3 verse 4 says this, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Now what took place then and what has to take place in our hearts and lives now if there's to be a revival among us? First of all, we see that there is hearing. Number one, there is hearing. In Romans 10, 17, Paul writes, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. D.L. Moody one day was struggling in his faith walk and, and he just didn't seem like his faith was growing and he opened up the 10th chapter of Romans and he read that verse. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And D.L. Moody had closed his Bible. He hadn't been reading his Bible and he said after reading that verse, he opened his Bible, he began to read, and he said, faith has been growing ever since. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You know, there are two things necessary to become a Christian. Number one, the word of God, and then number two, the spirit of God. In Luke chapter 11, verse 32, Jesus says about the men of Nineveh that they repented at the preaching of Jonah. So the word of God, working with the spirit of God, helped prime a revival in Nineveh. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, Paul writes, For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, and God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believed. So the world thinks that the preaching of the cross is foolishness, but we know that the preaching of the word is a declaration of truth so powerful, so powerful that it convicts the heart. It reaches down to the heart. Now, apart from the preaching of the word of God, there is no conversion, there's no repentance, and there's no revival. And the world sees that the preaching of the word is foolishness, but believers see the preaching of the word as the power of God, powerful enough to break a hard, cold heart. The words of Jeremiah the prophet in Jeremiah 23 verse 29 is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. You see, the hardest heart can be broken and penetrated by the hammer of God's word. Isaiah the prophet says in Isaiah 55, 10, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. You see, whenever God's word goes out, there is an effect. You know, years ago when I flew to Israel for the first time, we flew from Chicago to, to, uh, to Tel Aviv with, uh, in a 747 jumbo jet. 
That jet was um, 200 feet wide and 271 feet long, almost the, the length of a football field. <clears throat> and it would travel up to 660 miles per hour. <clears throat> I understand that a 747 jumbo jet has a wake. There's turbulence and air in the path that it creates that is so great that it can cause a smaller plane to crash. The pilot can lose control of a smaller pet plane if he gets in the wake of that 747. And you see, God's word is like that. Whenever God's word goes out, there is an effect, there is a wake, there's something that happens as a result of that word going out. Now you and I know that God doesn't always sow and harvest on the same day, but there are results somewhere, sometime. You cannot stop it. You cannot contain the results of God's word. God's word will accomplish what he pleased and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it, God says. It shall not return to me void or empty or meaningless, but it is productive, it's meaningful, it's significant, and it's weighty. So you and I must not neglect the word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is living and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division and of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Paul goes on to say in Romans 1.16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. Now in many, many churches today, preachers are leaving the word of God for other messages. You know, there's, there's no power, no power at all in user-friendly messages. There's no power at all in, in you-can-do-it messages. There's no power in messages on psychology. But there is power in the word of God. In fact, the worst preach message from the Word of God will accomplish far more than the most eloquent man-made message. So number one, number one, there is hearing. There is hearing. Now faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And then secondly, we see this, that there is believing. There is believing. There is one result expected when men and women hear the truth of God's word. And the result of that is this, that they would believe. And this is exactly what the people of Nineveh did. In chapter 3, verse 5 of Jonah, it says, the Ninevites believed God. Now, to believe means more than to mentally accept something as truth. In James chapter 2, verse 19, the half-brother of our Lord says, you believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe that, and they shudder. And then he goes on to say in verse 20 of James chapter 2, he says, You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? You see, the Ninevites had a genuine working faith. To believe in God in a biblical sense, demands faith and trust in all that God says and a complete commitment to His plan and to His purposes. God's Word working with God's Spirit changes a life. One becomes someone that they were not before. One becomes someone that they were not before. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation Old things have passed away, and all things have become new. Now, it is evident that the Ninevites genuinely believed. How long do you think a bleached and bald prophet like Jonah would have lasted in the most wicked city on earth if they had not truly believed? They would have killed Jonah in a heartbeat. And the only way that one can explain what happened is that Jonah preached and a faith took over in the hearts of the people so that they believed God. It was an inward, a supernatural transformation. I often ask here at Cottonwood, is there anything going on in your life, in my life, that can be explained for no other reason 
than that it is an act of the supernatural. It is an act of God. Now, you might ask, where does that kind of faith come from? Just like Vanya, the young man that we started this message about, where does that kind of faith come from? You know, it's to be received from God as a gift. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, that it is a gift of God. It comes from God. Your faith ultimately is a gift from God, and God wants all to receive that gift. In fact, 2 Peter 3.9, God is not willing that anyone should perish. Now, because God is compassionate, because he is gracious, something Jonah later resents, he gave even the king of Assyria the gift of faith to rise from his throne and to issue a proclamation of repentance to the Ninevites. So number one, there is hearing. Number two, there is believing. Number three, there is repenting. When the word of God is heard, and when it's believed by those needing revival or renewal, it follows that there will be repentance as well. Now, repentance is simply this. It's a turning around. It means this. It means to change directions. From going one direction, you turn around and you go the opposite direction. It also means a change of heart or a change of mind. A perfect illustration of this is the king. The king got off the throne he took off his royal robe, he put on a gunny sack, and he went out in the middle of the street. He sat in a pile of ashes, and he repented of his sins. Now, can you imagine the impact? I mean, that word spread like wildfire, I'm sure. This became the talk of the town. I'm sure the phone lines were busy. Do you know what the king just did? He took off his royal robes, We've never seen him without his royal robes and he has a gunny sack on and he sat in a pile of ashes and he repented. Can you believe that? And then he made a declaration that the whole city should do the same thing. I guess our king never heard that you don't mix religion and politics. <laughs> An incredible aspect of the Nineveh revival was that the king's decrees even included the animals. The animals, incredible that even the animals were covered with sackcloth. Now, this turning to God had such an impact that everything about the city was changed from the king and his court to the least person all the way down to the animals. Hearing, number one, led to believing, number two, which led to repenting, which is number three, and then number four, there is praying, there is praying. As a part of Nineveh's repentance and revival, an entire city was on its knees praying desperately that God would hold off his judgment. Jonah chapter three, verse eight, the king declared, let everyone call urgently on God. One translation puts it this way, cry mightily to God, cry mightily to God. Now these people who had prayed so often to false gods, began to cry out to the God of Jonah, the one true God, and then the king ordered the people to fast as well as to pray. This is totally unexplainable apart from it being a work of God. There was a desperation in the hearts of these people who dared to believe that God would do exactly what he said he would do. The Bible doesn't say they believed Jonah. The Bible says they believed God. And their actions showed that they did. And a true revival swept throughout Nineveh. Now it's amazing that, when, that, that what took place here in Nineveh after hearing a total of five Hebrew words. In English, it's translated in chapter three, verse four, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. That was the message. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Now listen carefully. With our bookshelves full of Bibles, how much more accountable for the word of God are we going to be? There is hearing, number one. There is believing, number two. There is repentance, number three. And there is praying, number four. 
You see, the only way that revival becomes community-wide or nationwide or worldwide, for that fact, is when individual citizens experience personal revival themselves. You see, revival begins in you, and revival begins in me. A.W. Tozer, the great pastor and author, wrote an article years ago, and the article's title is How to Have a Personal Revival. How to Have a Personal Revival. I'll share some points from that with you as we close today. Number one, he says this, get thoroughly dissatisfied with yourself. Get thoroughly dissatisfied with yourself. You know, that sounds strange when hearing so much today about self-esteem or self-worth, trying to feel good about ourselves, you know, building ourselves up. You see, a test of genuine faith is this. You have within your heart a hunger to know God. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, he says, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. Then he goes on to say, not that I have already obtained all this, but he says this. He says, I press on. You see, complacency and satisfaction will never let revival come. We must get to the point where we become thoroughly dissatisfied with ourselves. Number two He says this, he says, undertake a sweeping transformation of your life. He says, be completely focused toward attaining a life that is totally transformed by the word of God and the spirit of God. And he says, make this your number one priority. Let God's word and let his spirit shape you and mold you and transform you into what he wants to make of you. And then number three, He says this, is to put yourself in the path of blessing. Put yourself in the path of blessing. You know, it's a mistake to expect God's help or God's blessing in our lives if we are disobedient and complacent to his ways. You see, there are a lot of marked paths in the Bible. We need to figure out one for us and we need to get ourselves in the way of God's blessing if we wish to have personal revival. So, We need to put ourselves in the path of God's blessing. And then number four, and that is this, to do a thorough job of repenting. Do a thorough job of repenting. At Nineveh, the Assyrians named their specific sin. In chapter three, verse eight of Jonah, the sin they name is the violence of the Ninevites. Now, a question for us, what is a specific, specific thing that we need to repent of. You see, revival comes when we stop being general about the things that are wrong in our lives and we repent of specific named sins. So do a thorough job of repenting. And number five, make restitution wherever needed. Make restitution wherever needed. If you owe a debt, simply pay it. If you owe an apology, go ahead and make it. If you've not been honest, you have to correct that. The wrong road never turns into the right road. So make restitution wherever needed. And number six, line your life up with the scriptures. Line your life up with the scriptures. Be an obedient Christian, not just when others are around. Bill Hybels has written a book. It's titled, Who Are You? when no one is looking. I have to tell you a funny story. In the seventh grade, uh, I thought I was a model student. You'll have to take that by faith, I guess. <laughs> but one day, one day the teacher left the room and I, I perceived that as a window of opportunity. I looked towards the windows and I saw opportunity. <laughs> Richard Watkins was sitting over there and Richard had a, he had a flat top and he had butch wax, which, you know, how a flat top used to look. And anyhow, in that split second that the teacher walked out of the room, I thought, you know, that small flat top on top of his head would, would be a great airport for my old chewed up eraser to, to land on. So I flung that old chewed up eraser into orbit and guess what happened? Mr. Anthus 
the seventh grade teacher walked in as I was flinging that eraser. And I've never, ever seen him so mad. And I never, ever felt so bad. The one time in 12 years of school, I decided to do something stupid. I got caught. <laughs> the question is this, who are you when the teacher is out? Who are you when no one is looking? Ephesians 5.10, it says to find out what is pleasing to God. Find out what is pleasing to God. That's a, been a memory verse for our grandchildren for some time. And I'll just ask, I'll say, what does Ephesians 5.10 say? And they'll say, find out what is pleasing to God. <laughs> In 2 Peter 1.3, it says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and for godliness. So we need to line up our lives in every respect with the teaching of the Word of God. And then, number seven, be serious-minded. Be serious-minded. Believers should be, as Titus 2.6 says, sober-minded. You see, the road to revival is paved not with the jokes of the unspiritual, but rather with the joy of the Spirit. And then, number eight, deliberately narrow your interests. Deliberately narrow your interests. You know, there's, there's too many projects that use up our time and energy without bringing us near to God. Let me repeat that. There are often too many projects in our lives that use up our time and energy without bringing us near to God. And you know what happens as a result of that? Our lives become hectic and cluttered. Paul said this, he said, this one thing I do, this one thing I do, not these million things I dabble in, but this one thing I do. And you and I need to focus on one thing, and that is this, to be God's person in this world. Now, revival is intensely personal. It's intensely personal. Revival doesn't need to come to the White House. It doesn't need to start in the White House, but rather revival needs to come to our house. It needs to start in my house. And all of us, all of us need to recognize and acknowledge that. A pastor at a Bible conference had a roommate and early each morning, his roommate would get up and go through this ritual. The pastor was puzzled. He asked the other pastor, he says, what are you doing? And he said, I'm drawing a line around myself and asking God to ignite a revival inside that circle. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reminder that you've given to us today from the book of Jonah. Uh, only you can create a revival, and we have to respond to your calling in our lives. And Father, I pray that you would cause a revival to take place throughout our world, in our country, in our nation. And Father, it all begins in each one of us individually. So in the quietness of these moments, let's just all ask ourselves, let's dedicate ourselves to God for, for praying for a revival to take place in our own hearts. Let's do that today and let's follow through with that prayer for many, many weeks and months until revival comes. Thank you, Lord, for the reminder that you've given to us today and remind us of your love for us, your great love for us, that the Bible tells us that God loved his only son. He gave him as a sacrifice so that we might have eternal life. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but rather have everlasting life. Thank you for loving us and allowing your son to care 
for us in the way of dying for our sins and making it possible for us to be with you for eternity. Thank you for that. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.